You know what that sound means. It's time for the Michigan DNR's Wild Talk Podcast. Welcome to the Wild Talk Podcast, where representatives from the DNR's Wildlife Division chew the fat and shoot the scat about all things habitat, feathers, and fur. With insights, interviews, and your questions answered on the air, you'll get a better picture of what's happening in the world of wildlife here in the great state of Michigan. Hello and welcome to Wild Talk, the first Wildlife Division podcast. Today, I'm your host, Katie Keen. And I'm Hannah Schauer, and we're so excited to be bringing you this awesome Wild Talk podcast. Today's podcast will feature a chat with Chief Russ Mason of the Wildlife Division, and we'll be taking some time to answer your questions in our mailbag. And we'll end this podcast with some updates about Michigan's elk. But before we get started, let's give a little background about the Wildlife Division. The DNR is divided up into different uh, divisions, and so we've got forestry division, fisheries, law enforcement, parks and recreation, marketing outreach, minerals, and of course, wildlife division. So we all focus on our specific subjects of expertise, and then we also reach out to one another in all those places that we overlap. So wildlife belongs to everyone in the state of Michigan, and the wildlife division is managing those wildlife uh, resources on behalf of all Michiganders. And so wildlife impacts and benefits us in a variety of ways. It impacts our economy, attracts tourists. It also provides uh, different recreation opportunities and, of course, ecological benefits. Conservation and management in Michigan comes from hunting and license fees, in addition to an excise tax that's on different sporting equipment. So it's a user pay system at this time that benefits all of the wildlife in Michigan. And we've had great examples of success. Animals that have been virtually eliminated in Michigan in the early 1900s, which is really hard to imagine a deer today, a black bear, or even a wild turkey being hard to find. So it's a a really good example of success of conservation conservation, and management. The elk and bear hunting application period has come to a close, but you still have a shot at hunting elk and bear, as well as the opportunity to take home a hunting prize package valued at over $4,000. With the Pure Michigan Hunt, not only could you win the elk and bear tags and take home that prize package, but you also get licenses for antlerless deer, spring and fall turkey, and first pick at a managed waterfowl hunt area. Pure Michigan Hunt applications are just $5 each, and you can enter as many times as you like. Visit michigan.gov slash PMH for more info or to buy. So during this segment of the show, we're going to share some of what we're working on to help fulfill our wildlife mission across the state. We're going to start in the Southwest. Hannah, any news to share? Yeah. Uh, Back in April, the DNR, uh, along with the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy, celebrated a newly added 355-acre parcel purchased from the Sean and Boom family. It's the largest addition to the Berry State game area in its history. It's got farmland, forests, wetlands, um, and also a segment of the Glass Creek, which uh, flows north into the Thornapple River. This property contains the headwaters of the Glass Creek watershed, which we've been involved with with protecting for decades. So this is a pretty large withholding within the game area. It sounds like a great place to go out and explore. How was this parcel paid for? Well, it was paid for through the Michigan Natural Resources Trust Fund, Tide and Ventures, and the Southwest Michigan Land Conservancy. So uh, Trevor Schonenboom and her late husband, Wayne, have worked very closely with the DNR on several conservation projects in the past, such as trapping and relocating turkeys and participating in the hunter access program. So this addition of this land really ensures more of those wild spaces uh, for everyone to take advantage of and enjoy. So let's go back to that hunting access program. So what is that? The Hunting Access Program, or HAP, is a land leasing program where private landowners can lease their land and allow public hunting on it. Uh, Now, the private landowners who enroll can specify what types of hunters are allowed on their property, how many at any given time, and what types of game they're allowed to harvest. So for those property owners who might be interested in participating in the Hunter Access Program, they can find out more about enrolling their property at mi.gov slash 
H-A-P. And if you are a hunter looking for some private land that's open to public hunting, particularly in the southern part of the state where there might not be as much public land available, you can also visit mi.gov slash HAP and uh, find out where these properties are. Katie, what do you have happening in the Upper Peninsula? So the Upper Peninsula, or what we call the UP, we have staff that are wrapping up several surveys that they had been working on throughout the winter months. Many surveys take some time to be able to complete. And you might think that spring and summer is the best time for surveys, but not always. Uh, The winter months are great for tracking because of the snow. Also, we can really see whatever it is we're looking for in contrast against that white snow. And then finally, the leaves are off the trees, so we can get a good look, if it's anything from the air, to be able to find that critter. That's great. So what kind of surveys have they been working on? Well, a couple of them would be the winter wolf survey, the winter bat hibernacula survey, sharp-tailed grouse occupancy, and even a fawn to adult deer survey. So not every survey is done every year. And many times we have other organizations that help us because it's so much time to be able to do across the landscape. So we've got to give a good shout out to all of those groups that have helped gather all this information over the years or maybe just this past winter. We could not do it without you. Tell me a little bit more about the Winter Wolf Survey. So the Winter Wolf Survey is a track survey, and we're able to get a good population estimate by looking for those tracks and being able to figure out where wolves are in the Upper Peninsula. So wintertime, again, we're able to find the tracks. We're able to follow them by air uh, to determine how many or how many packs. And this survey is done not every year again. It's every other season. And what about the grouse survey you mentioned? The sharp-tailed grouse occupancy survey is pretty important because it's a way we can measure whether hunting has had any impact on the population. And what we've seen over the life of this survey to date is that hunting is not impacting that population. So Hannah, let's head on over to the southern part of the state. What's going on? We've also got some surveys uh, happening down in the southern part of the state. So down in the southeastern region, they're participating in the uh, Spring Breeding Waterfowl Population and Habitat Survey. Uh, This is part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service Migratory Bird Program. This is where our staff will fly over lakes, wetlands, farm fields, rivers, in airplanes. And they're looking for ducks, geese, swans, and sandhill cranes. Why do we do such an intense survey? Well, this is to estimate the size of the breeding waterfowl populations across North America. As I mentioned, it's part of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service program. And so um, this helps us evaluate habitat conditions on the breeding grounds. And then uh, the biologists compare the data to previous year's data to determine the waterfowl populations are on par with the long-term population average goals. They hope to see numbers at or above the long-term average on these flights that they're conducting. So it looks Looks like we've covered the southern portion of the state and the upper peninsula. What about the northern part of the lower peninsula, Katie? Well, the northern lower basically put out the mitten and you're looking at the knuckles north. We're in the midst of something called the bear hair snare survey. Say that three times. Um, And we're just wrapping up the American woodcock routes too. So both of these surveys help us to get an estimated population on these two animals, which they're both game animals, meaning they're open to regulated hunting. So with the bear hair snare, basically we have baited locations with barbed wire surrounding them, and we're trying to capture some bear hair to be able to send back for DNA analysis. And with the American woodcock routes, we're listening for painting males. It's a, it's a sound that they make that more than likely you've heard, but maybe never realized it was a woodcock. So that's our um, springtime way we can estimate um, the males that are here that actually um, come here to breed. And Michigan is one of the leaders of the amount of young that are produced as a result of the breeding. Gotcha. I'm curious, what sort of bait do you guys use for your uh, bear hair snares? Now we try to use something um, that they don't normally have or else it wouldn't be a bait that's drawing them in. So at this point, we're using bacon and then also donuts. All right. So along with uh, the bears, do you guys, have you been getting many spring bear calls? Yes. The northern lower region definitely takes a good share of calls 
walk-in emails um, about bears in the spring and actually even throughout the summer. We live in an area where we have lots of black bear. And so we give recommendations on what landowners, business owners, and even communities can do to not encourage bear into their area. It's a real important message for us because we need to keep wildlife at a distance, which means removing those food rewards that are out there like bird feeders. Now, I think as we wrap this up, let's do a quick mention about our chronic wasting disease or CWD meetings that we held across every region of the state. Yeah, we held uh, 11 meetings in total throughout uh, April and May. And uh, kind of the purpose of the meetings uh, was to collect input from uh, pretty much everybody. So we're looking for hunters, community members, other people who are just interested in uh, regulation and management for deer. And so these were all to get their input and thoughts on uh, what we could do as far as regulations for deer hunting and management of chronic wasting disease within Michigan's deer population. So CWD or chronic wasting disease is a hot topic right now for everyone. So we had great attendance numbers. About 650 people were actually in attendance at these 11 meetings. Now, of course, if people could not attend or even wanted to review it again, they could look at um, the entire presentation online and still get that information about chronic waste and disease. And the big thing was, is we wanted to get input back. So we had surveys filled out both online um, and in person, for people to share their thoughts with us on what they think about CWD in Michigan and the deer herd. Yeah, we really appreciate everyone who took the time to either come to a meeting or share their thoughts with us, as well as those um, who shared thoughts via the online survey, even folks who gave us a call or sent us an email um, with their thoughts and concerns. We really appreciate hearing all that feedback and getting everyone's uh, input on this issue. So that's all from around the state. Stick around. Next up is our interview with Chief Mason. All right. Well, today in studio with us is Wildlife Division Chief Russ Mason. Welcome, Russ. Thank you so much for joining us. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me. So, Russ, just to kind of start things off, we thought it would be um, fun to kind of put you in a situation. So, so let's just say um, you're on your way home and you stop at the grocery store, but of course you got that DNR shirt on and someone asks you, so you work for the DNR? What do you do? So what do you tell people that your role is with the department? Well, you know, it's an interesting question because I don't want to lead off by saying, well, I'm the wildlife chief. So more, I, I actually, when I get those questions, I'll ask them, what do, what do they want to know? What What is it I can help you with? And and frankly, I get a fish question as much as an invasive species question, as much as a, as a wildlife question. And I'll try to answer it as best I can. Often I'll invite them back. So, uh, for example, just to use one, the other day I was uh, flying to the UP to go to a meeting in Ishpeming, and I was sitting with the pilot in the front of the plane because there wasn't enough room in the back, and we got to talking about his instruments, and he said he had some questions about wildlife, and I ended up inviting him back in. He's coming in this week, and we'll sit out of my office and talk about a few things. I've been able to gather things from when I'm at the grocery store. I try to point people toward the right resources, but more important uh, to show them that we, every one of us, truly care about the resource and truly are interested in relating people to those resources because ultimately the strength of the department and the strength of our natural resource programs depends on that public support to feel that that we are always operating in their best interest and trying to understand their perspectives. It's great to see when people recognize that DNR logo. So how long have you been with Michigan's Wildlife Division, Russ? Well, I have been here in Michigan for almost 10 years. It'll be 10 years this August, which makes me the second longest serving wildlife chief in the history of the department. Before this, I was the wildlife chief in Nevada. Before that, I was the science advisor to the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. And before that, I had a 17-year career with USDA Wildlife Services. So I came to Michigan with with a wide background. The best part of coming to Michigan is Michigan is one of those places where people truly care about the resources. The natural resources in this state are here primarily because of expert management over the last 120 years. And the people here are as well trained or better trained than any agency that I've worked with. So it's uh, it's a wonderful working environment. It's also a spectacular place to try to conserve and protect our natural resources. 
So along those lines for uh, conserving and protecting our resources here in the state, um, I know we have a lot of partnerships with various organizations here in Michigan. Uh, could you tell us a little bit about why those partnerships are so important for wildlife conservation? Well, they're important on, on a number of levels. I mean, you know, the straightforward answer is that that allows us to expand our reach beyond what we're able to do with our own staff and our own resources per se. But it's more than that. Uh, when you sit down with stakeholders or you're working with them on a field project or you're talking about various things or you're sharing responsibility, that gives folks a feeling of ownership. And that sort of proprietary ownership that people feel about their natural resources is absolutely key as we figure out how we're going to protect, conserve, and grow our natural resources in the 21st century. People have to feel like they are their resources, not our resources. The last thing you want is somebody working with you in a sort of a, I demand it, and you either give it to me or refuse it. I demand it again, and I back and forth and back and forth. That's up and down kind of a relationship is anything but beneficial because it leads to a sort of an unhealthy codependent cycle where people aren't working together. They're just perpetually mad at one another over some issue which is then supplanted by some other issue when they get tired about talking on the first one. So that's why partnerships are important, both to protect our resources, but also to build the collaborations upon which conservation and the feeling of conservation absolutely depend. I love that feeling of conservation. So expanding our reach. It's less, you know, into the future than it is looking about where conservation came from in the first place. So if you look at the early 20th century and you look at the achievements that Teddy Roosevelt accomplished, they were accomplishments that were driven by a number of groups, but primarily Boone and Crockett, the Audubon Society Club, and the New York Zoological Association. That happens to be today Wildlife Conservation Society. So one of those groups was strongly hunting. One of those groups was kind of iffy about it. One of those groups was anti-hunting. And they put aside their their petty differences on the relative use of gunpowder and moved forward to do a whole variety of things. They established the first National Wildlife Refuge, the Millinery Act, the Fur Seal Act, the Bison Act. They uh, protected game species and other wildlife in the national park system. And they did that all in 10 years by putting things aside. So when we reach out in this collaborative, this is joining together hunting groups, groups that are, are less interested in hunting, together and looking at the really important things that matter, like how do we provide habitat for species and for all wildlife into the 21st century. Everybody needs to be involved in this. Our models where hunters were paying license revenues, and that's paired up with uh, excise tax on the sale of, of hunting-related equipment, that's an effective model, but slowly but surely over time, it's getting weaker. We need to reach out and, and create this new alliance, which in fact looks like the old alliance, to move forward to assure that conservation is as we want it to be for our children and our grandchildren. Could you uh, elaborate a little bit more about Michigan Pheasant Restoration Initiative, uh, GEMS or Grouse Enhanced Management Sites that are throughout the state, those partnerships and uh, the role they play with conservation here in Michigan? All of these really are designed to do two things, three things. One is to work with partners on those things that they are most interested in. So the GEMS, that's really rough grouse and rough grouse society. That waterfowl stuff reaches out to DU and Michigan waterfowlers and others. The pheasants uh, actually is a broader collaborative because it brings in all of these groups, whether it's uh, uh, National Wild Turkey Federation, Quality Deer Management, Pheasants for whatever, and brings them together. It provides that opportunity for stakeholders to get to know one another, just like, by the way, the MyBirds does, um, which is something they don't do. You know, it's interesting if you look at the history of American conservation. One of the things that is most troubling from my perspective is that all of these NGOs become businesses. And by businesses, they are going to look to protect a market share, to compete with others. So the pheasant guys will say, I do this better than you guys do. And the grouse guys will say the same. And Audubon says the same. And whomever says the same. Point being, instead of talking about how each of them is better than anybody else, let's find these higher issues, whether it's healthy young forests or open grasslands or uh, wetlands, and bring all of the groups together, bring all 
all of their forces together, so on some higher plane, they're all talking about a single shared interest and not competing with one another. Uh, that's been... Uh, a great possibility as well you know if you if you look at things like the pheasant restoration initiative it's an interesting opportunity when we first started it i was interested in grasslands well what i discovered is that there are a huge number of hunters out there that that uh, and others but hunters primarily that remember the 50s 60s and 70s when pheasants were king in the state of michigan in fact the year that we started that i was at a mucc meeting and i saw a bear hunter on the other side of the room and he looked at me he pointed at me he started over with his brother and i thought oh here we go what is it this time and he walked over and he shook my hand and he said that pheasant restoration initiative is the best thing i have ever seen that is something i remember doing when as a kid, this is something that we can invest in together. So these things have an opportunity to, to bridge differences, maybe not on the topic that they most often talk about, but bridge differences and bring people together to do things that are good. The Pheasant Restoration Initiative also is an opportunity to bring together hunting and non-hunting folks and, and try to partner them. And each one of these things is, uh, whether it's gems or turkey tracks or pheasants or uh, something else, these are opportunities to reach out as well to the non-hunting community whose uh, species of interest, I suppose you could say, also benefit by these management efforts. Well, that's really great. So it's good to know that all these um, different partnerships and efforts that we're putting forth kind of bridge that gap between the different groups and really bring wildlife management and this conservation to the forefront of everyone's mind, that larger goal of keeping these resources around for generations to come. We need to build a community. For too long, we've talked about a wildlife community as though it existed. These are all opportunities to create a true community that acts together and is aligned and coordinated to move forward this notion of wildlife and wildlife conservation, which is terribly important for me in terms of the recovery of Michigan economically and also for those things that I think are truly important. More important, perhaps, uh, I admit that I'm a member of a small minority, but wildlife conservation to me is more important than just about anything else because it sort of represents the salvation of what's really important in America. Michigan has so many different organizations. When we start seeing those listed out, it's just amazing. We have so many groups that care, just like you said, and the community that could get built. Now what we need to do is figure out how we reach out to people that don't join groups. We need partnerships with people that you will never see at a commission meeting or a PF meeting or somebody else's banquet or participating in a raffle or whatever. There are large numbers of younger people, and not just hunters, it could be hunters, fishermen, or bird watchers, it doesn't matter, that literally don't join anything. So how do we essentially create that virtual community that will act together, will act stand up, act, say something, contribute something on behalf of wildlife. That's that's the next challenge that uh, I think is in front of us. Sounds like a great challenge. Yeah, let's take it on. <laughs> Giddy up. <laughs> so what do you think about this new way to communicate to our customers? This is our first Wild Talk podcast. I think it's a great idea. Obviously, if you pay attention to our culture and you pay attention to the way that people communicate, the way that they're portrayed communicating on television, uh, the way that they're portrayed communicating in the news, this is an approach that has the potential to reach out to people that would not, as I say, otherwise join. They're not going to a banquet. They're not showing up in a meeting. They're not, I don't know, doing other things. This is a way that to, to reach out to those folks. And, and in that sense, I think we need to try every new method because I have no objection to finding every conceivable way to proselytizing when it comes to wildlife and wildlife conservation. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Chief Mason. We really appreciate it, and we hope to have you on again soon. I would look forward to it. Nothing I'd rather do. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Russ. Check yes for the Recreation Passport when you renew your license plate at the Michigan Secretary of State. The Recreation Passport is just $11 when purchased with your license plate registration renewal and is your key to visiting more than 100 state parks, accessing staff public boat launches, parking for rustic forest campgrounds in hundreds of miles of trails, attending free family outdoor events and classes, and protecting our natural resources for the next generation. Visit michigan.gov slash recreation passport for more information. 
All right, welcome back to Wild Talk. I'm Hannah, and with me today is Katie, and we're going to continue this episode by unzipping the mailbag and answering some of your questions. One, two, three. So one of the first questions we're going to talk about is a hunting season that just wrapped up, the spring turkey hunting season. And I just got an email the other day from Mike, who was a successful uh, turkey hunter. He got a bird, and he wants to tell us about the hunt. And so the best place, any spring turkey hunter, whether you harvested or not, so whether you got the bird or you didn't, if you got the license, you purchased a license, we want to hear about it. You can go to mi dot gov slash turkey. You can scroll down and give us your hunting report, your hunting harvest report. We want to know what turkey management area you were hunting in, when you harvested, just lots of information about your hunt that helps us determine the harvest for that year and also that level of satisfaction we're looking at for hunters. The spring turkey hunting season is pretty unique because it's staggered, which means we have multiple openers. We want to spread those turkey hunters out um, so we don't interfere and affect each other hunt um spring turkey hunting all turkey hunting is a lot different than deer so we can't all be out there at the same time we got to spread it out to get that good satisfaction so make sure to tell us about your hunt whether it's successful or not at mi.gov slash turkey awesome well we'll definitely have to check that out and report uh our success for turkey season. Um, Another spring question that we get quite often this time of year uh, is about fawns. So I had uh, an email from Julie uh, who said, I found two fawns. They only appear to be a couple weeks old uh, and she found them in her backyard. She says the mom comes by in the morning and again in the evening and she's kind of wondering when those fawns are going to be expected to leave. And uh, she said someone suggested that she put the fawns outside the backyard fence and that the mother would show up and they'd be on their way. But she wasn't sure with them being so small if putting them outside the fence would leave them vulnerable until the mother returns. And also uh, she asked if handling them would keep the mother away. Uh, And so this is an excellent question and we get this very often where people have spotted a fawn that appears to be all by itself or they might have a fawn in their backyard and are kind of wondering, you know, how long is it going to be there? Um, So the important thing here is to not touch the fawns and leave them alone. It's actually a defensive strategy that the deer use. They leave their fawn, they kind of hide it in a secluded location or what they think is a secluded location. It might not appear so to us, but they've um, hidden their fawns and they're doing that because the fawns are fairly well camouflaged and they also have very little scent. So this makes it particularly challenging for a predator to find a fawn. Um, And so the mother isn't going to hang around and advertise where she's hidden the fawn. She will come back periodically to nurse it, uh, but that's it. Then once the fawn um, is old enough and able to keep up with its mom, then it will start accompanying her and you probably won't see it very often. And so deer leave those fawns kind of hidden and unattended on purpose. Spring in Michigan. It's always something. Mm -hmm. So um, another email that I just got the other day, and I actually get calls about this too, so I thought it would be great to mention, is people are planning those trips up north And maybe for one reason or another, they just discovered that we have black bear in northern Michigan and they're looking to either camp, hike, just get out and enjoy the outdoors and they want to know what to do. So the best thing in any situation is to be prepared, to have thought out what you would do and how you should behave. So basically, bear can hear, see and smell us before we know that they're there. And many times that's all it is. You never even get to see the bear. The bear's kind of ID that there's a human and they're gone. It's kind of when we see each other, we might surprise each other, that it gets a little exciting. And so the first thing we can do is when you're out and about, make noise, travel in groups. Again, giving them that warning that there's something in the area and that there's no surprise. So people can sing or whistle. They could maybe carry a bell on them or their pet. They could then carry things to make themselves also feel comfortable, like maybe a whistle or one of those small, um, like a marine air horn, but they make a 
smaller version for hiking, backpacking, and hunting. It just is a loud and obnoxious noise rather than you yelling. You could do that. Some people might even carry bear spray to be comfortable. But these are just things you can think about to make yourself feel comfortable, but then also when you're outdoors, just making all those noises. Because, like we said earlier, we've got thousands of bear in northern Michigan, but we also have lots of people who live and work and play in northern Michigan, and it's very rare to have any type of human bear interaction. But just know what to do. So, say you see that bear. If you're kneeling or on the ground, stand up. You want to appear as large as you can. If you have anything in your hands, you can make it above your head so you appear larger. And um, stop that forward motion. So if you are running or walking, stop your movement and directly face the bear. So if you have to make any movement, you back away slowly. You could also talk um, to it in a loud, stern voice and just maintain your calm, maintain your cool, and just put yourself into that situation and then tell others around you of what to do if you were to see a bear. Now, our goal again is to keep wildlife at a distance. It's that fear that wildlife can lose with that food source is what we don't want. So a typical bear that hasn't been fed or trained is going to have a natural fear of humans. Now, when you're camping, you also got to keep in mind your food and the clothes that you cooked your food in. So if you're out camping, store that food in your trunk or locked car with the windows rolled up. And if you were cooking, you know, bacon in your flannel shirt, take that flannel shirt and put it in your vehicle too. Don't have it in the tent with you. You just don't want to attract bear to your location. Gotcha. Well, that's good to know. That's probably why I never see any bears when I'm out hiking because I'm way too loud. <laughs> yeah. Same with my family. There's not, we, yeah, we don't tend to see much because we're loud. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, another question that I get often in springtime, um, which you probably hear about too, Katie, is that people have found either eggs or baby birds or even a bird's nest and are kind of wondering what to do. Some of those can be put in kind of some odd locations. But I uh, got a question from Karen the other day and she found a robin's egg uh, near her home and she didn't know what to do with it because she couldn't really see a nest where it may have come from. And so she wasn't sure what to do. And she was pretty concerned about about the egg and its safety. And so the thing with eggs, or even if you find a baby bird that's fallen on the ground, is it's really best just to leave it be. Um, as I mentioned with the fawns, the best place for them is wherever you found them at. Uh, just leave them be. Wildlife needs to remain in the wild, because uh, that is really where its best chance for survival is. Now, unfortunately, we do have eggs that might get blown out of a nest or a predator knocked them out or some other circumstance which they ended up on the ground and there's not really a whole lot we're going to be able to do to help that situation but with say baby birds that have fallen out the nest or fledglings they're just starting to maybe learn how to fly and so they don't have all their flight feathers so it's really common to find those baby birds hopping around on the ground. The good news here is uh, the parents will continue to care for it and feed it even when it's on the ground so you don't need to worry about that piece. And if it's a sparsely feathered baby, like maybe got blown out of the nest in a windstorm or something, and you know where the nest is, and it's safe for you to get to fairly low to the ground or something where you don't have to climb up precarious distance or anything like that, you can put it back in the nest. Some people hear about the, oh, if I touch a baby bird, the parents will abandon it. And that is a myth. Most birds don't necessarily have the greatest sense of smell, so they don't really care what their babies smell like. So you mean what my mom was telling me all those years wasn't true? Right. It wasn't true. Um, and it, it's still a good practice if you find a baby bird just not to touch it at all. Um, but just know that the scent isn't, your scent is not going to make the parents abandon it. But it is best to leave it be just because if you do move it, the parents might not be able to find it to care for it. So it's only if you know exactly which nest it came from and can reach it safely. And if you do find a baby bird and you've been watching it for a while and you don't see the parents coming to take care of it um, and you're really concerned that way, a licensed wildlife rehabilitator can take in uh, abandoned or injured wildlife. And so those are folks that have gone through training, have licenses and proper facilities to take in wildlife, and they're the only ones who are licensed to do so. So if you find uh, a baby animal that appears to be abandoned and you're fairly certain that's the case, you can contact one of those folks and they might be able to provide some assistance. And we have our full listing of everyone who's permitted in the state at MI 
ny.gov slash wildlife. You can also call any of our customer service centers and they can help you um, get some numbers for folks in your area. But the list is always available online, again, at mi.gov slash wildlife. So we have one more item down in that mailbag, and it's about bear and elk hunting applications. So the application period just wrapped up, and now people are wanting to know, when am I going to know my results? So those results are posted online on June 25th. So you can go, use your driver's license number, which is how they are tracked, and find out if you were successful in the bear or elk hunting drawing. Now, if you don't have access to the computer, you can always give us a call. You can stop by. You can ask us to look you up, and we'll let you know if you're successful. Give us a call at 517-284-WILD, and we'll let you know. Don't forget either, um, if you forgot to apply this last application period, let's not let that happen again. If you text 64468 with the line MIDNR space hunt apps, so that's MIDNR space hunt apps, you will get text reminders throughout the application period. So we'll let you know when it starts, when it ends, and we'll even give you a reminder in the middle to just don't forget to get your applications in. That's great because I'm always forgetting what I've got going on. So I appreciate getting those reminders so I know when I need to apply so I don't forget. So we're going to zip this segment to a close. And remember, if you have questions about wildlife or hunting, call us at 517-284-WILD or email us at dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov or even just stop by one of the offices and maybe your question will be featured on the mailbag. All right, and finally, we're going to take the last few minutes of Wild Talk to talk a little bit about elk in Michigan. So 2018 is a pretty historic year for elk, and that's because 100 years ago, in 1918, Michigan's elk population was reestablished. So Michigan was known to have elk across the state prior to settlement. Although when large settlement started, a lot of things were changing quickly. And so when we think about the forests that we have today, many of those were being cleared in large scales to build communities. We needed product. We needed wood. We needed um, to build homes. And then also we had to feed families and make money. So elk had no protections at that time, just like any wildlife. You could take as many as you wanted whenever you wanted, however. So if you can imagine, you could feed your family and make money by harvesting an elk. So folks were harvesting a lot of elk. Something like that is called market hunting, when you receive money for a harvest, something that's illegal today, but that could be done back then. Same thing with that regulated take. Today, we have lots of regulations about how you can harvest animals, and that's because we want wildlife to be around forever for everyone and to be healthy. So what was going on in the late 1800s, for the most part, are not happening today because of changes that have been made in conservation. So those seven elk were brought to Wolverine, Michigan from the western United States to establish, to reestablish a population here. So what we have today, our population of elk we have in the northern lower peninsula has all derived from those seven elk brought 100 years ago. So, um, Katie, can you tell me why we picked northern Michigan as a location to reintroduce the elk? Why why they're what's well, special? Elk are a huge herbivore. So basically think about deer, and we all know that deer in your garden or your hostas around your house can be affected. So elk are the same way. They eat a lot of vegetation. They're a huge animal. So they're a member of the deer family. So in Michigan, we have white-tailed deer, we have elk, and we have moose. Moose are in the upper peninsula in pretty low numbers. Elk, again, we only have in the northern lower peninsula of Michigan. But we have to control where, where they go because it's such a large animal and they eat a lot. So you think of our forests up in that northeast part of the state. It was thought to be a great location because lots of food is available. So the Pigeon River Country State Forest is up in that area of the state. And we do a lot of timber management up there today. And when we say management, that means it's well thought out. 
where we're cutting, how much is cutting, and across a 10-year scale. That's because, you know, back at 100 years ago or more, the forests were cut on large landscapes all at once. And so we know today that those practices need to be better managed, better controlled and thought out. And so timber is kind of like a win-win because by cutting it, a renewable resource, we're providing excellent wildlife habitat, not just for elk, but great places to live for lots of animals because you're creating young, thick forests. And that means it's vegetation they can eat, they can reach it, and they can hide, they can have cover from predators. And we do that by cutting timber. And then all of a sudden we have industries and we have products that are coming out of that. So it's it's a win-win. Right. So it's really incredible to think about if you, you're you looking around whatever room you're sitting in right now, all the different paper products or products from wood from the timber industry. And it's really incredible to think that we have that industry right here in Michigan and it contributes so much to our economy. Yep. To economy and, and wildlife habitat because it's creating young forests across our, our forest. So in 2018, we're celebrating 100 years. So it's a pretty cool success story of habitat management, increased law enforcement, and a healthy and abundant population that is actually now hunted for control. But again, it's regulated hunting. It's a lot different than it was over 100 years ago. We always want elk to be around for everybody. And something that we're doing this year to help uh, celebrate this 100-year celebration is the DNR license plate is now an elk. The common loon had been on the plate since it had began, and so it was thought that with this big celebration of elk in 2018, let's let's finally change that image on the plate to help celebrate this anniversary. And so people can get that elk license plate. They can show that elk pride by putting it on their ride. That's awesome. I'll have to check that out when my birthday rolls around. Now, if I wanted to uh, figure out where I could get this license plate, I assume the Secretary of State and online at mi.gov slash elk, I imagine we can learn a little bit more about elk and the license plate there. Now, where does the funding from this license plate, because it's one of those uh, fundraising plates, where does that money go to? Yeah, all of the specialty or fundraising plates have special places that the money goes. So for our plate, for the wildlife, for the DNR plate, that money goes to the non-game fish and wildlife fund. So the funding model has not changed. We simply have a new fresh image to kind of help pick up the sales of that non-game fish and wildlife plate. And then also to help that celebration and to just let everyone know in Michigan that we have wild elk here. So by going to our website, mi.gov slash elk, you can click on the link that will take you straight to the Secretary of State page. You can also download viewing maps if maybe this fall you want to get out and see if you could see or even better yet, hear an elk, because elk have an amazing bugle that they will sound out to communicate to each other. So visiting that website, you can learn all about Michigan's elk. Fantastic. All right, well, this has been Wild Talk. Thanks for joining us. Again, this is Hannah with my co-host Katie, and we hope you enjoyed this episode. This has been the Wild Talk Podcast, your monthly podcast airing the first of each month and offering insights into the world of wildlife across the state of Michigan. You can reach the Wildlife Division at 517-284-9453 or dnr-wildlife at michigan.gov.